Welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 27. I'm Doug Barak, joined by my co-host Chris Mahalan of Nets Daily and our special guest. Our guest is the social media manager, multi-podcast host, and on-air talent for John Boy Media. We welcome Keith McPherson to the podcast. Thank you for taking some time out of day to join Doug and I. What's going on, man? Yo, what's up, fellas? Thanks for having me. Excited for this. Uh, happy Monday as we're heading into scrimmage week. NBA scrimmages start Wednesday, um, and then opening day for MLB starts Thursday. So we've made it. Sports are coming back. We're back to talking about live sports and action, and uh, the pandemic shutdown is behind us. Well, it's definitely. And before we get into all the scrimmages coming up and sports on the horizon, mostly what you've been up to since COVID-19 put the world at halt, and especially sports at halt. Man, everything, just working, preparing, trying to, you know, maximize everything at John Boy Media that I have my hands in, uh, helping John Boy, helping Jake, helping all of our platforms and all of our different properties, trying to stay in shape. You know, I've been running and I bought some dumbbells during this quarantine pandemic to try and uh, keep fit because not being able to go to the gym is something I've never had to deal with in my life. But, you know, other than that, you know, just eating right and, uh, you know, still finding time for friends and family to party on the weekends, uh, head down the shore and enjoy the weather and uh, just pass through this time. You know, it's it's a crazy year that we're in and uh, we're on the second half of it. But I, I think, you know, the people that pushed through, the people that had, you know, focused and uh, really worked on their craft are the ones that are going to shine through at the end of the year. So I'm, I'm looking forward to closing it right. Most definitely. And then aside from the gym, which you mentioned earlier, what kind of adjustments have you kind of had to adjust by, especially on the work aspect with everything kind of going virtual? Has there been any adjustments, any hard adjustments that you kind of had to go through? during? Yeah. Time? So, I mean, in my in my um, apartment complex where I live, there's a like a basketball court and there's a full gym. So I was getting up at like six o'clock in the morning, going to shoot for like 15, 30 minutes and then getting a workout get out of there by like 7.15, 7.30. And I, I pretty much lift on a regimen where, you know, I'll hit each muscle group Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday, and I have a, a trainer that sends me workouts. And once they shut the gym down, you know, he started sending me other stuff to do in the house without weights, and I wasn't feeling it. I, I, I had no motivation to do push-ups, sit-ups, body weight squats. So I had to adjust from there. And trying to order dumbbells or equipment was impossible because everybody was ordering them on Amazon, Amazon, everywhere else was backed up, but I finally got a pair of dumbbells. So that helped a lot. And I really just got into, you know, running more outside running, uh, try to run like two, three miles a day in the morning. And then, you know, literally just doing anything I can to stay active and stay fit because being a podcast host, social media guy, I'm sitting at the computer, honestly, like eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah, no, that's definitely a lot. And hopefully the market value for the dumbbells wasn't too high over because that's the thing I've noticed personally is they're extremely high or, as you mentioned before, unaccessible. Yeah, I saw some people trying to, I guess, make a quick buck off of the fact that they had dumbbells for sale. But I think these were cheap. They, they're like 15 pound dumbbells. I think I got them for like 35. That's not bad. No, that sounds probably right. But anyway, switching gears a little bit, can you talk about your journey and where you are today? Uh, what college did you go to and what was your first uh, media position internship? Yeah, yeah, it's it's been a, a quick journey, but a long journey, if that makes any sense. Like the time has flown by pretty quick, but I've been at this for a long time. Uh, I grew up playing sports, playing football, basketball, baseball. I guess I was best at football and that's why, you know, focused on that I got a scholarship to play football at James Madison University went there in the south in Virginia uh, it was a great school great time but ultimately the student and athlete thing didn't work out for me I transferred out and I came home I uh, wanted to be back in Jersey and uh, I started to know what I wanted to do more in media television radio which is now like social media podcast uh, live streams but I went to Monmouth University, came home, played football there, and really focused on getting into the radio, WMCX 88.9 FM radio at Monmouth University, and then even being on um, Hawk TV, which was Monmouth's television channel. And from there, I knew, like, okay, this is what I like, and I can figure out how to, you know, 
do sports in this. And I was also a DJ at the time. So it was like, you know, it made sense to DJ on the radio and then break in the sports talk. And once I graduated, don't get me wrong, I graduated and it was quiet for me. Like nobody was checking for me. I had nothing. I had no leads. I had no connections. No one putting my resume on the top of the deck. Like it just sucked. So I took a job at Guitar Center for a little while being a DJ. And uh, that was cool because I got to like, you know, spin all day, sell professional audio gear, talk to other DJs, artists, whatever. But I only worked there for half a year and I applied to what was called the MLB Fan Cave in 2014. And the MLB Fan Cave picks eight kids, just about eight kids across the country to represent different teams and watch the entire MLB season from New York City in a, a hub downtown. And I was fortunate enough in 2014 to be picked as the Yankee fan. And it was Derek Jeter's final season. So there's a lot going on. And the Yankees didn't make the postseason that year, but you know, the, the farewell tour was everything. And that kind of put me into the world that I wanted to be in. And I knew then I said, okay, now I have something on my resume. I had went a couple years from college without anything uh, popping up for me and the fan cave started it. So I went from the fan cave to MTV. MTV used to have a, a television show at the fan cave once a week called off the bat. It was on MTV too. Uh, I was on that show a few times and I was able to find my way into MTV too, just because the person that was, hiring for a social media coordinator recognized the one thing I had on my resume, which was MLB fan cave. And I worked at MTV for about two and a half years, met a lot of great people there, really learned, I guess, you know, the corporate world there and learned about managing social media and running uh, Twitter, Instagram, you know, even back then there was Vine and Snapchat was starting to really emerge. And, uh, you know, I made friends with guys like Jesus and Mero, uh, Nick Cannon, Charlemagne the God and, you know, all the producers at MTV. But after a while, I knew I wanted to get more into sports. And I, you know, once once you have something on your resume, then you can kind of be in the driver's seat. So after two and a half years, I left and I went to Fubo TV, which is a digital streaming platform. Uh, you guys probably see Fubo when you're trying to search for how to stream games. But when I went to Fubo, they were very new. They didn't have all the channels that they had and they had no social media presence. So they basically said to me, hey, you're our first social media guy whatever you see fit do. And I was able to take my sports knowledge and kind of funnel it through the brand and the brand voice and be anonymous behind the scenes, just putting Fubo sports where it need to be. And I worked there for about a year and rock nation came calling and Jay Z, uh, you know, his sports media company, well, his, his sports agency and his, uh, you know, record label as a media company together at the time, I was like, this is it. I can't believe they actually reached out to me and offered me and I took that position, but it was a very quick stay. I was only there for a few months. And I think what it was, was that, you know, I saw how, you know, the music business ran, how the sports agency side ran. And then I saw what I was myself. And I knew that I needed to combine, I guess, what I did in college with what I did in the corporate world. In college, I was on camera, I was on air. In the corporate world, I was behind the scenes doing social media. And I left with no job lined up and I said, okay, I'm going to start building out my Twitter, my Instagram, my YouTube. I'm going to go to more games. Uh, I'm going to travel and follow the Yankees and go see different NFL teams and um, literally just put myself out there and see if it takes, see if it works. Started a couple of podcasts, made a couple of videos, a couple of them hit and fast forward. And now that was two years ago. Now I'm with John Boy and John Boy Media. John Boy is a friend of mine. Uh, Jimmy O'Brien is someone that I watched kind of in a similar way with me. You know, he quit his full time job and he decided that he was going to start John Boy Media and he was going to cover the Yankees full time. It blew up and he was able to, you know, get an office in the Bronx, hire people. And I'm fortunate enough to be one of the people on those uh, one of the people on the team. And I do social media managing, which is like my, my title, I guess, because I help oversee all of our social media accounts. But then I'm also on air. I'm also hosting talking nets, talking sports, and pinstripe strong. That's good to hear, man. Then I guess I have a two-part follow-up question for you. I know a lot of listeners know that I like to pr ask this question a lot to our guests. Uh, so the first part is, so along those stops, I would imagine that you had a lot of mentors that kind of taught you certain roads or certain advice along the way. So that's my first part is who are some of your mentors? And then the second part is kind of what was the best advice you received? And that's kind of a question that you could kind of take in your own aspect. 
Man, honestly, and this is different than a lot of people, but like nobody helped me. Nobody put me on. I didn't have any mentors to go to. I, I had wished that I did. I remember struggling in um, like 2018, 2019, just not making the money that I was making in the corporate world. And I was unsure if I made the right decision. And I had said, all right, I'm going to go back in the corporate world. And I had interviewed at a bunch of different places, companies. I interviewed at Foot Locker. I interviewed at MLB. I had, uh, you know, multiple interviews at some big companies in New York and I fell flat on my face. And I remember thinking, man, if I, you know, meet some people in the industry that do what I do, I'm going to latch onto them. And then also I'm going to be a mentor to some younger people. So I didn't actually have, you know, even like, I didn't have one person really to go to for advice. And I remember thinking that I wish I did, but now, you know, through my Yankee stuff online, I was able to connect with the yes network. And in the last year plus, I have great relationships with the Yes Network. And there's a handful of people over there that they've been in television. They've been in media. They've been in sports. They know the game. And I look at them as mentors. I'm very thankful to have the Yes Network, um, you know, kind of look out for me and kind of see my talent and decide that they were going to put me in a couple commercials and they were going to keep me in the fold and I have guys at the Yes Network that are producers and, you know, executives. And if, if I send them a text or an email, they answer right away and they give me, the, you know, all the advice I need. So as I was figuring it out, I didn't really have any mentors. No one was looking out for me. And it was it was a struggle, man. I, I drove like Lyft, Uber Eats. I was working at a restaurant, but I always had faith and I always had the work ethic and I knew I would get there. And now I, I think now I have more mentors since I've actually gotten to a place where, you know, the content that I'm putting out, it works and people have accepted me as a podcast host or video host or whatever. It's good to hear, man. Especially it's a little inspirational, too, because that mostly shows that, hey, you were one of those guys that really kind of got their footing, kind of took what you could get and, and everything like that. And I guess my final part of this question is considering what you just explained to us, what advice would you give to those looking to get into the field that you're in and taking their talents to that next level? Uh, nobody's going to give you anything. If you got it, you got it. If you don't, you don't. And if you don't have it, work on it. That doesn't mean you won't have it forever. You know, if, if you're not the best speaker, if you're not um, the best on camera, if you're not the most knowledgeable, you have all the tools at your fingertips. If you have a phone, you can search things. Um, turn your camera on and practice. Get in the mirror and practice. Read. You know, I tell people all the time, if you read more and not just reading Twitter, but if you read books, you read articles, it's going to help you with your enunciation. It's going to help you with your speech. And, you know, you can do it. it no one's going to give it to you. No one's going to hand it to you. It's, go it's not going to be easy. That's another thing. People think they're going to just jump in this and have a million followers. They think they're going to have a million views. Don't worry about the number of people watching. Worry about the number of quality pieces of content you put out a day, a week, a month. Are you building? Are you growing? Are you doing new things? Like, it's going to be tough. But, like, if it was easy, everyone would do it. If it was easy, trust me, there are way more sports fans than there are people working in sports. If it was that easy, everyone would do it. But if you want to do it and you're passionate about it, that's the first step. If it's something that you love, you'll work hard and you'll fight through the tough times. And then when you figure it out, you'll shine through. Facts. Appreciate you sharing that. I think your next side hustle should certainly be a uh, life coach. Yeah. Yeah. Some people have told me they're like, uh, I could see you as a motivational speaker. And I was like, I got to do a little bit more. I got to have more to stand on for anyone to really take my words and say, okay, if he did it, I could do it. But yeah, I, I, I think down the line, you know, whether it's a life coach, mentor to some young people, or just sharing my story to motivate the next person, I definitely want to do something like that. Yeah, no, I, I definitely feel that the energy uh, that you have behind you, you know, just is pure confidence. So it was nice to hear. So switching gears just a little bit. Uh, when did you begin watching the NBA? Um, what was your, one of your first early memories of this uh, league? And what was your favorite team growing up? And when did covering the NBA specifically, because you mentioned the Yankees before, become a dream and focus of yours? Yeah, so I was a Bulls fan. I was a Jordan guy. I, I was young in the early 90s, and I got brought into the league like many other people, just seeing Michael Jordan and like Mike, wanting to be like Mike. And I didn't even know where Chicago was. It's funny because I switched teams later in life, but I tell people about, you know, when I was a front runner as a kid, I didn't know where Chicago was. I didn't know where Dallas was. They're not states. They're cities. So when you pick a team at five, six years old, you don't know where these cities are. You know the emblem. You know the players. And you latch on to that. So I latched on to Jordan. 
I remember one of my earliest memories was uh, the Bulls versus Sonic series and just it going late into the night um, when we played or well, not we. I wasn't on part of the team, but as a fan, you say we. But when the Bulls played the, the Sonics in Seattle, it was late at night. And I remember begging my mom to stay up and watch because I knew I'm like, this is history. This is big. Everyone in the world is watching this. I can't go to sleep. And even though at the time I was probably like eight years old, I knew I was like, please, mom, please let me stay up. And my mom let me stay up and watch uh, the finals. And every year after, I always watch the finals. But I would say around the time Jordan retired and the Nets started getting good in the like early 2000s. And then the Nets obviously had our finals run. By that time, I knew, okay, I'm in New Jersey I'm rooting for the home team. The Nets could actually do it. I really thought we had a chance to win a title. And uh, I kind of ditched the the Brooklyn, not Brooklyn. I I ditched the uh, Bulls for the Nets, and I haven't looked back since. And um, as far as covering the Nets, in the last few years, I've really just, you know, looked at the Yes Network and looked at the the Nets, and I knew we were trending in this er this, area. I knew we were trending in this area, like in this way to, like, last year pick up Kyrie Irving and Katie like I knew there was going to come a time where uh, we'd land those free agents and I've been rooting for the Nets hard I I actually boycotted the team the first year they went to Brooklyn because I didn't get it I just was like oh this is a publicity stunt but then I saw the the Nets play the Bulls when like Nate Robinson was on the team I think it was 2013 and that was like some of my first games at the Barclays Center and I was like this is so much better than Continental Airlines Arena like, you know, the East Rutherford. And I kind of wondered last year when I, you know, really started catching on with the Yankees and I started gaining followers and, you know, I was on the Yes Network commercials and stuff. I, I actually have a video somewhere where I'm in the Barclays Center and I say, I wonder if I can do what I did with the Yankees, with the Nets, which is saying like start a podcast, cover the team and figure out how to be in this world. And through the Yes Network, I was able to do that. That's really amazing to hear. And since you mentioned Michael Jordan and Bulls being your early team, what were your thoughts on The Last Dance? I mean, I love The Last Dance, especially because if you think about like what, when they start that, like late April through through May, it was must-see TV and it was appointment television. Every Sunday night at 9, you knew what everyone was watching. and uh, I, I, I think they did a good job with it. I think that that era deserves as much you know praise as it got. And Jordan even though he produced it and he made everything, you know, in his way and he made everything kind of depicted as he wanted it. I enjoyed it a lot. And it was, you know, it was taking me back to my childhood and uh, that dynasty that they had. I don't think we'll ever see anything like that again in the NBA or maybe not even in sports. So uh, it was a great time to, to be alive for it and great to, you know, be a grown man looking back at it in the uh, documentary they put out. That's cool, man. I agree with you on that. And then kind of trace back a little bit more, get off the Bulls topic and start talking about your Talking Nets podcast. When did you begin talk? When did you start the podcast? And what was your inspiration behind launching? I know you mentioned it earlier when you're at the Barclays Center. You're like, you know what? Maybe I could cover this team and start up what I was doing with the Yankees. But trace back a little bit to the Orange and part. So when did you start the whole podcast? And like, what was your inspiration behind launching it? So I guess I had listened to a couple Nets podcasts. Uh, shout out to the glue guys, Mike and Brian, I actually know personally, and I think they have the best Nets podcast out, but they've been doing that for like 10 years. And um, when I first started working with John Boy, which was late last year, around, let's say, October, we connected obviously on Yankee stuff, but I was trying to see where I could fit in on the team. And Talking Nets had already been an idea. They just didn't have anyone to host it. So... I looked at it as an opportunity. This is before I was even on payroll. I looked at it as an opportunity to say, hey, you know, I can cover the Nets. I'm a Nets fan. I know some NBA. I have experience doing podcast radio. I have experience in social media, what, you know, is literally what it's going to take to promote the pod. Let me get this off the ground and show you what I can do. And I, I did that fairly quickly. And, uh, you know, here we are now, 41 episodes in, on our last three episodes had. Sarah Kustak, Chris Sheeran, and Michael Grady, all Yes Network talent, all people that I've been able to connect through um, through my Yes Network connection. And it's, it's great to now pair that together with, you know, John Boy Media, the Yes Network, Talking Nets, and, you know, bring everything together. 
Yeah, no, it's definitely wonderful episodes. Whenever I hear some of the names, especially from the Yes Broadcasting crew, I have to tune in. Doesn't matter who's hosting the podcast episode, just hearing what they got to say, even if it's the exact same thing with different people, I love it. And one thing I got to ask is, uh, your co-host Hudson. Uh, so, how did you guys connect and come together to form the Talking Nets podcast? So Hudson, he's just a, a sharp youngster. Like that young man, he's he's smart, he's talented. He knows his basketball, and he also is learning now his social media through me and through just experimenting trial and error. And, uh, you know, he's a student at Fordham, so he's in the Bronx. And John Boy Media Office is not far from the Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. And um, he actually just responded. When we first started, we were looking for interns. We were looking for some help. We were looking for someone that could possibly, like, you know, just, like, tweet games or, you know, just help us do uh, what we were doing. And he was you know, lucky enough to be the guy. And um, we started off talking nets with me and another guy, but he fell off and, you know, didn't really take the podcast that seriously, wasn't interested in it. And I said to Hudson, listen, man, I, I have some people that, you know, I know are interested in being co-hosts for talking nets that are outside of John Boy Media, but I want to keep this thing in house. And you've already got the passwords to Twitter and Instagram. You've already been in the conversations on what the roadmap is, what the plans are for this. I was like, let's do, let's do a trial run. I think it was like episode eight. Hudson stepped in to, to co-host because our other co-host was flaky and he crushed it. And I said to John boy, I was like, where'd you find this guy? And he's like, I didn't. And like, I don't even remember. I think he just popped up in the DMS or something. And I was like, okay, I talked to him a little bit more. We went to this uh, event at the Barclays center, which was, it was like a season ticket holders event. We don't have season tickets, but we were able to get an invite and like you see the players walking around and you get to shoot on the court. And we went there and I got to meet him for the first time. And I'm like, OK, yeah, I, I trust this kid and I think we're going to do great things. I'm going to elevate him to co-host and he's going to learn on the fly. And he's been great. I, I know everything happens for a reason. And that's exactly how it was supposed to happen. That's wonderful to hear. It's going to be great talking to him uh, in the next episode. So I'm sure he will mention you as one of his mentors for sure. Yeah, man, that's good to hear, and all the best for you guys moving forward with the Talking Nets podcast. All the best from our end, but the transition a little bit to the NBA bubble. So first, what were your initial thoughts on the NBA reviving their season when the whole plan was being kind of developing and everything along those lines? What was kind of your initial thoughts behind it? What are your thoughts today about kind of the NBA reviving their season, heading into the bubble, and kind of things going in order and stuff? I mean, I'm a big fan of the NBA, like not just the players in the game, but the leadership, like the business side of the NBA, Adam Silver, uh, how he's able to, you know, just be progressive and do things the right way consistently since he's taken over. So when the NBA, when the NBA got suspended on March 11th, right, they were the only major, well, the hockey was going on, but I only follow MLB, NFL, NBA. So NBA gets suspended and... MLB hadn't started yet. Football was months away. And I just remember thinking, how long is this going to take for them to figure out when we can restart the league? Because we can't leave it as is. Like, there's a whole another half a season to play and playoffs. Like, we got to get this season in. I was excited about it. I remember hearing rumblings of Vegas, rumblings of Orlando. And then it became pretty apparent that it was going to be Orlando. And the NBA was the first major sport to break that hey we're gonna come back and you know most likely play in orlando and i think they've done a lot to make sure that it's safe i think they've done a lot of planning and preparing which obviously it's underway now um i think they have a smart situation there where hey if, if all goes as planned this is going to happen and it's history and you know i always say the nba leads and everyone else will follow i think a lot of the leagues were looking at the nba to see how they would handle this the nba took coronavirus very serious like we saw Rudy Gobert touching mics. And a couple days after that, we hear he's tested positive. They shut the entire league down. They didn't play around. They didn't let it go a couple days, week. They shut it down completely. So um, I, I follow the NBA. I think other leagues follow the NBA, and I think they've done it right. And I'm very excited to see how this bubble goes. I hope not too many guys you know, do anything that could potentially mess it up. That's good, man. And then, like you just said, you talked about a lot of the stuff you liked. Is there anything that you dislike so far with, in, in their plan so far? Uh, I mean, just really the things that we're all laughing about. You know, th these guys are NBA players. They're millionaires. 
they're in this like hotel eating, you know, box food and stuff. Like it's from the outside, it seems like not that glamorous. But then when you really think about it, these guys are paid to hoop. They're hoopers. Like if it seems like an AAU tournament, fine. Like most of these guys played AAU, they should be able to go in these ballrooms and play in front of no one. And, you know, most of these guys work out in empty gyms, so they should be able to turn it right on for this. And I'll have probably more of an opinion on what I don't like when it comes time for uh, the games to be aired. But what I don't like, and I understand it's it's for everyone's safety, is this snitch hotline. How you got guys telling on other guys, like, I know it's to keep everyone safe. I know it's supposed to be like an anonymous line in case someone's breaking the rules. And, you know, that's 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 needed because it's trying to, you know, it's for safety. It's trying to protect everyone. But I don't like the the, the thought of, like, someone else calling on or calling someone out or someone calling the line just to like either play games or try and gain an advantage on someone. I think they could have, maybe they could have tried to keep the snitch line a little quieter. Yeah, for sure. And then what do you feel about the kind of what goes on in the bubble, like the NBA bubble life, Twitter account, what they've been posting the T Stiebel's content creation side of things. How do you like that kind of different side of outside the just play on the hardwood, what they're doing, the creative aspect, the hobbies that they're doing, fishing, golfing, all that kind of stuff. It's 2020, man. We might never see this again. This is literally history as it's happening. I like that we're able to get this view. I like that we're able to see these guys' experiences through the technology and the platforms we have. If this happened 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to do this. We wouldn't have this access. I'm sure they actually have a film crew there that's going to make a documentary or something down the line. Uh I hope we never end up in a situation where the NBA has to be played in one site. I hope we never end up in a situation where we're playing pandemic basketball like this again. But it's cool. That's another way the NBA wins. You know, MLB is playing at everyone's individual um, ballparks and they're not giving you much of the um, behind the scenes of that, which is fine. But these young kids are on TikTok. They're on YouTube. They're on Instagram. They want to see they want to see what their favorite players are doing. And then that also grows these players' brands. You get to see their personalities and what they eat and what they wear and what they're into and how they talk and where they're from. And I love it, man. I think the NBA does a lot right. That's cool, man. And then I guess a question for you as well. What would it take for you to break quarantine the NBA bubble? I know that there's a financial penalty if a player breaks. Say you are a player. And I know there's a financial penalty if a player breaks quarantine once seeding games start on July 30th. Each game missed will project roughly 1% salary. Also, you'll need to be required to stay in your room for 10 days. So what would be one of those things? I know from the family aspect, but mostly to you, if you were in that situation, what would it take for you to break the quarantine in the NBA bubble? I guess to see my wife. I guess to see my girl be with my girl. Most of these guys are breaking the, the rules to get food or uh... – I guess to see or to sneak women in. I don't know if we've gotten that far. I don't think any, we, we got rumors of girls being invited to the bubble or snuck in, but I don't think uh, we've got any confirmation that anyone's doing that. I'm not breaking the rules for food. Like they're going to like the food is what it is. They're going to have food for you to eat. And uh, I'm not breaking the, the rules for Postmates. It would have to be to see my girl. It would, it would have to be for my, uh, my future wife to come, come through the bubble. That's very fair. I think on our last episode, Chris said he'd break it for McDonald's, but maybe it, maybe it was out of context. No, I didn't say I didn't say that aspect. I would say like, hey, if, if I was getting pretty poor food and stuff like that, and you know, but something. McDonald's though, McDonald's is pretty bad food. Like they're gonna have better quality food than that. But if you're a McDonald's super fan and you you know you can't go uh, a month without tasting those fries, I get it. Yeah, you know, McDonald's is one of those aspects man it's one of those good good (laughs) quality food you know i'm a big fan of it but i guess to move on a little bit i know me and doug answered this on the last podcast but what would you be your five must-haves to bring to the bubble what are those five objects what are those five things that you are going to bring oh you got to have you know some some type of bluetooth speaker i always keep my jbl speaker with me you got to have your beats uh as well as like your headphones just to get in the zone um got to have your music right um, I don't know. I saw that they're setting up a barber shop. I was about to say maybe some clippers or some type of hair products. Keep your hair looking right. Keep your presence, you know, looking right. Um, so you're not wolfing out here too hard. Uh, what else? I, I, I got to sleep with like an eye mask, wrap my hair up, put earplugs in. So I would definitely need all my sleep and stuff. Uh, I have bad allergies, so I would need my nose spray, you know, my allergy pill, my eye drops for that. 
uh, what's that like four things? Yeah, something and I, like I, that. I guess something last like but not least would be my you know my MacBook. My MacBook is like my child. I bring my MacBook almost everywhere I can. There's just so many things that I can do with it from audio to video editing to social media to watching you know Netflix or documentaries on. And I say my MacBook last. No Xbox or anything like that? No video games? No, man, I wish. I, I just, you know, I, I don't have time to play video games. I wish I'm I not a gamer. That. I guess I treat, like, social media and video editing. Adobe Premiere is my video game. I like it. So you like take it more as the being, like, a member of the media approach if you were in the bubble more than if you were a player or just someone more general, right? I mean, even if I was a player, like, um, Diebel, he I don't know where he, he might not be editing his stuff. He might just be recording it and sending it Oh, it, it seems out. like it is, at least the way he's presenting it. It seems like he's doing everything, which is amazing. Yeah, so then he, I'm sure he's got a setup with his MacBook and, you know, a monitor or whatever in his hotel room. So you, you need that technology. If you're stuck in a bubble, you need that link to the outside world that goes beyond your phone. I think the MacBook is it, whether, whether you're media or whether you're a player. That's cool, man. And then I know it's early. I know a lot of stuff could happen between now and the NBA finals. But if you have to pick a team right now, who do you think wins it all? Uh, I honestly think the Clippers win it all. I, I want to see LeBron do it, but I just think the Clippers are built to do it. I think they've got probably the best coach that's in the top teams. I think they've got the deepest team. I think they've got the best practice team. Like I feel like these guys run tough practices and – They've been around each other long enough to mesh. The Lakers got some new pieces, and they're missing some pieces. Uh, and I think this this season, if they can steal this little 60-game, not 60-game, that's baseball, if they could steal this little bubble tournament um, and into the playoffs, that might be the passing of the torch in L.A. You know, it's, it's Lakers town, but they're trying to make it a Clippers town. They bought their own arena that's coming soon, and they're fighting for respect. So if the Clippers can go in here, you know, hold on to that two seed and potentially match up against Braun and the Lakers, beat them, run into what we expect to be Giannis or whoever comes out of the East. I think the Clippers got it. And you think they I can like do it. that without Doc Rivers using the snitch hotline to uh, jokingly <laughs> rat on all the teams just to have a tactical advantage? Yeah, I think Doc was playing. I don't know how much he's really worrying about that, but he's good with the media. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so switching gears to... Our team, uh, so the state of the Nets heading into Orlando. Uh, how many seeding games do you think the Nets will win? Um, man, I don't Especially know. Especially with all these changes, it's it's really hard to pin it on now. I'm a homer. I'm a Nets fan. I want to say that we'll win some, but I have no idea what this team is going to look like. I'm interested to see the scrimmage. I'm interested to see these games leading up. Like, we should beat the Wizards. We should beat the Magic. You know, we might be able to surprise a couple other teams or whatever, but... Uh, I can't put a number on it. I feel like if I put a number too low, then I'm underestimating them. If I put a number too high, I sound like too much of a, a homer. But let's go Nets. Jamal Crawford Nets. Like, who would have thought we'd have Jamal Crawford in the bubble with us when this whole thing shut down in March? Nobody saw that coming. Yeah, no, it's very impressive. I think the most recent over-under for the Nets, uh, for the seeding games at least, is two and a half games. I yeah, want to take the over, three. but, you know, we we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what dominance Karras will bring in that kind of thing, but let at this I mean, point it's two, at, at two and a half. I would have to go three because we're gonna beat the Wizards and then we we should beat the Magic one of those two games if not both. I I don't know. I, the the Magic are gonna be good. I I guess I'm going over. Sounds yeah, my, my Magic good. number is like three. I, I'm comfortable with saying three. Four is a little bit of a stretch. I think three is like you're sitting comfy. And do you think we keep the seventh seed? I think we we figure out how to hold on to it. And even if we drop, I, f I feel like we'll still be in it. But I think we figure out a way to hold on to it. Um, we would have to win, and the Magic wouldn't have to play so great. But, yeah, I think we can hold on to that. We're definitely going in to the playoffs. And of the two teams that could theoretically, let's say we keep the seventh seed, and uh, which team would you rather play at the second seed? And how many I mean, games we do you all, think we'd win? We all rather see the Raptors. Because we all know that that first round against Giannis and the Bucks is probably going to be a sweep, whether you're the Magic, whether you're the Nets. So we're rooting for us to keep the seven seed. And I know that the team has got to be focused on trying to stay there, too, um, and play the Raptors, who obviously without Kawhi, you know, they're the defending champs. But without Kawhi and 
we've had some run with them in the, in the uh, past, in the recent past, where I think we could match up against them and and hold our own. But I think they beat us too. Um, honestly, it's not this this bubble is not for the Nets to steal and win. No, uh, we're, we're we're if we're out quick, we're we're it's on to audition. next season, right. right? And we're taking the guys that do well in this bubble on to next season with Katie and Kyrie. Yeah, and I'm not sure how many games behind the Celtics are to the Raptors, so that would be a potential other option with the seven seed. But I think I still would prefer the Raptors at this point. And then, uh, which players do you think fans should focus on? Like, who's been? You've obviously mentioned Jamal Crawford, who everyone, not just Nets fans, has their eye on him. So, who are some that you were looking at? I mean, everyone wants to see if Karis LeVert can continue to do what he did. Before the shutdown, he was going all the way off. Like he was looking like he was finally hitting his superstar stride in the NBA, which all of us Nets fans knew he could do, but he just had to stay healthy. I'm also looking forward to seeing Joe Harris. I think for the first time, maybe in a long time or ever, Joe Harris is going to be free to chuck it up. I want to see Joe Harris shoot the three and get more looks at the three and be aggressive and play hard. Um, Jared Allen too. Jared Allen, go for it, bro. It's it's your time. There's nobody else. L- literally, there's nobody else. Uh, show us what you got. Um, I'm looking more so at those three than any of the new guys because those guys are, you know, they're they're old regime nets. They've been here, and I think that's who's going to carry us. Yeah, and they're also the ones where we're not sure where they may be going into next season because of potential either trades or free agency, depending on who they are. So that would kind of transition well to the next question. So what do you think, and this is definitely not for the season, as we mentioned, uh, what do you think the Nets need to do to win a championship next year at the earliest or just in general? And what moves should they make, if any? And that also applies to coaching as well. I think after this little bubble stint in the summer and going into next year, I think we just need to tighten up. We need to find a leader of this team. If it's Jacques Vaughn, so be it. If there's someone else out there, like they're rumoring Mark Jackson, fine. But I think we need to tighten up once we have the unit, once we have the leader as head coach, you know, keep things in house. Don't play in the media. We know New York media. We know sports media and the NBA media is going to be centered around Brooklyn. And there's going to be more hype than we've ever had with Katie and Kyrie on the way to playing together. And I think we are looking at a championship team just having, you know, those two guys and the role players will have around them. I just think to win, we gotta like we gotta stay away from the drama. We gotta stay away from the headlines. We gotta stay with people hate KD. They hate Kyrie. Out of all the players in the NBA, people love to pick on KD and Kyrie and say things about them. If this team's gonna win a championship, they gotta, you know, have a, a strong head coach, a strong bond within this team and block everything else out. That's fair. And then as we've noticed uh past few months, the Nets have been starting to acknowledge their history. With having, you know, Dr. J was in the house towards the end of the uh, before the break, as we'll call it, Um, you know, they're acknowledging more beyond Brooklyn. So what are your thoughts about that? And uh, should they retire VC? And what are your throwback jerseys? You know, I know you guys posted them talking. That's today. Um, Some top ideas. But what are your, let's say, top three jerseys that they could potentially bring back? Yeah, I mean, this is something we've been talking about for months, it seems. So we did see them bring Dr. J back, and they had, I think they had like a Dr. J Black Panther bobblehead night. That was awesome. Give him his roses while he's here. You know, he deserves that. Now, with VC, you know, that's, that's our era. That's our era. That's our guy. I heard a lot of people actually saying, though, like, Richard Jefferson should be retired before VC as far as him being a net. And we know, yeah, VC played for a bunch of teams and he was big with Toronto as well. But I think he deserves that. I think what he means to the entire sport, what he means to, you know, the entire league, he deserves that. And maybe if they don't retire his jersey, we still do a welcome back Vince Carter night with the throwback jerseys, one of them that he wore. So I think I put on our twitter that i liked option a which was the red nets jersey and it says nets across the chest um i have the white one i don't think we're gonna wear the blue or the gray because they physically say new jersey 
And that's going to kind of like ostracize the Brooklyn and the New York people that won't want to wear a New Jersey jersey. So if they're going to make throwbacks, I think it's going to say Nets. And I'd like to see either that white or that red with the, you know, side, the blue side and the like, I don't know what that is, like silver cross pattern. Um, And then also a Vince Carter bobblehead night. Like, let's get a a Vince Carter bobblehead night when we bring the throwback jerseys in. Do that if they're not going to retire his jersey. Yeah, and hopefully they can do both jerseys, bobblehead, and the banner. Um, hopefully they're allowed to have people in the stadium. You know, yeah, that, that's mean, that's another truth to that. Uh, it's definitely going to be interesting, and I'm very curious. Um, it's probably not even going to be next season when fans come back, and if it does, I'm very curious what kind of capacity they'll do it, mandate mask and all those type of things. So, hopefully, it'll all go smoothly in that regards. Um, just trying to think if there's anything else. So I guess one other thing is since, you know, we're talking about retirement and even though he's far from it, what about Brooke Lopez, even though Kyrie has his number? You know, not a lot of people have talked – people have talk, started talking about him again lately only because Disney is his uh, land of opportunity even though it's more of a world. Yeah. But what, what are your thoughts? Do you think someone like that – because he didn't have that flashiness to him like VC did and that's kind of why he made New Jersey more popping than – it could have it was at the time especially transitioning from kid into brooklyn so v i mean vc is one thing but below is another right like vc didn't play as long with us as brooke lopez brooke lopez was on that terrible team that we had he went through you know some bad seasons he went through some seasons where we went to the playoffs he kind of was that rock for us that consistent and i think he deserves some kind of respect when he's done playing from the nets and i know he'll He'll get that. Um, I think I even saw when we did, I think we put out like a who's on your Nets Mount Rushmore. And we saw a few people put Brooke Lopez as being on their Nets Mount Rushmore. So he's going to get the love. He's going to get the respect whenever he retires. It'd be nice to see him get to uh, a championship with the Bucks soon so that he can start thinking about retiring. But yeah, I, I, I love Brooke Lopez. I wish he turned into more of a splash mountain with us, but if you guys remember, he was hitting threes. He had some games with multiple threes on his way out of Brooklyn, and uh, I'll, I'll always have respect for that guy. I always yeah. have respect for what he did for for the New Jersey Nets when we were bad and when we were a playoff contending team and when we were signing Darren Williams and then signing, um, you know, washed up Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett. So, for sure. For sure, and I guess we'll leave it right there. But thanks again, man, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to talk to Doug and I and talk everything Nets and much more. Chris, Doug, thanks for having me. Uh, glad to come on the Wingspan podcast, and um, we'll figure out when to have you guys on talking Nets and just keep working and keep covering uh, you know, the, the NBA, the Brooklyn Nets, and building this Nets community, hashtag Nets Twitter. It's awesome to see um, you know, more people that – are coming together that support the nets and that are working together doing podcasts and social media like that's how it builds uh, i've seen yankees twitter come up in that way and obviously the yankees are huge but where we're heading with this nets team with kd and Kyrie and the hype that's going to be around brooklyn like there's it's community over competition there's a lot of guys doing this and we should all be connected and working together yeah no definitely it's the foundation years and hopefully like the spurs you know we start early start the winning now and uh keep it consistent even after Kyrie and katie yes yes uh, the winning culture is here it is it is very soon upon us and i i think the fans are a huge part of that the fans are a huge part in the online presence and how people view the team and that's twitter and these little different um, accounts that are popping up and podcasts that are coming up, it's better for us to be united than to be competing against each other. So let me know if you need me, and I definitely want to see when we can have you guys on Talking Nets. For sure, for sure. M- most definitely, man. Before we give the close remarks, you want to let a- let our listeners know where to follow you, where they can reach you, and all that kind of good stuff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first off, follow John Boy Media. I'd rather you follow John Boy Media than me just because that's the overarching brand and Makes more sense for you to like start there and then follow Talking Nets. So at John Boy Media on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere, YouTube, and then at Talking Nets on Twitter and Instagram. I'm working on our YouTube. We've, you know, just started rolling out videos with Yes Network talent. So I'm working on getting the YouTube together. Follow at Talking Nets. But then you can follow me on every other platform at just my first and last name, Keith McPherson. Um, There's an underscore between. Keith and McPherson on Twitter. But if you want to follow me, you'll you'll find it. Just search K-E-I-T-H 
M C P H E R S O N. Well, thank you again for joining us. Hey, and, thanks uh, again, guys. Um, of appreciate it. And hopefully the gym routine, you know, gets better <laughs> as we go on. Hey, it is what it is. I've accepted it. I figured, you know, hey, the best I can look, the best I can do is what I can do. We're living in a complete different world. I'm not judging myself off the standards that I once did when I had access to a gym. So, well, exactly. Appreciate, That's 20 appreciate the humbling take. Anyways, Chris, uh, time to give close remarks. You got it, guys. So feel free to remember to send over any suggestions, questions, comments, or thoughts on any of our content by sending an email to wingspanpodcast at gmail.com. And do not forget to follow us on our social media channels. But most importantly, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on your preferred listening service. And as for next time, stay classy, take care, and keep on staying safe, people.